and welcome back so in the previous video you saw us drop the oil pan but in this one we're going to start out with something a little bit different it's maintenance related we're still working on the truck but what we're going to do here is we're going to prep these valve covers uh, to get them painted uh, so it's going to mean we're going to clean these up we're going to degrease them and what i'm going to use for cleaner is just some spray away glass cleaner you can see here and then to degrease them just some mean green uh, degreaser slash cleaner you can see here you could use purple power or any other type of degreaser and then once we get them degreased up we're going to um, cover up the areas that we don't want covered with paint uh, which is going to be you know obviously the grommets where we thread in our uh, spark plug coils and then we'll put a couple strips of uh, tape on the bottom just to seal up the channel in which the uh, rubber gasket, the new rubber gasket, will eventually go into. And uh, just like we did on our 6.4, if you've watched that series, we're going to use a little Chrysler Hemi Orange. It's a, just made by Duplicolor. It's engine enamel, it's ceramic, and you can see the, the number of it there. It seemed to work out pretty good when we did these on the 6.4, and there's a couple of reasons why we're doing this. Did we absolutely have to do this? No. But you know what? We're here. We're going to take advantage of the situation. We're going to clean things up, paint them a little bit, make them a little bit, make them look a little bit, a uh, little bit more colorful than they do now. Also, because uh, two other reasons, uh, as you know, we're putting a Hemi oil, I should say, a Hellcat oil pump into this uh, vehicle and a baseline Hellcat it's valve covers or orange and then you step it up to the red eye which I believe are red and then the Demon if I remember correctly actually has, has black valve covers so since we're using a standard Hellcat oil pump yeah we're gonna go with orange just like we did in the 6.4 as well as the individual who will be receiving this truck once it is finished um, I asked them the other day uh, what color what was one of their favorite colors one of their favorite colors just happened to be orange so that's going to be the other reason why that we're doing this so and i know they watch these videos so now they know the reason why i was asking that question so without further ado like i said we're going to work on getting all this uh grit and grime years worth of grease and dirt and things of that nature you've seen on these head on these valve covers off then we'll get them taped up and then we'll We'll commence to get them painted, but I'm going to go go ahead and clean them up now, and then I'll bring you back. Thank you much. Bye. And welcome back. As you can see, we got our valve cover. Um, quite a few, quite a few rounds of our degreaser, and a few rounds of letting it soak in our glass cleaner. Does a pretty good job of uh, getting all the grit and stuff out, and of course a little bit of elbow grease just getting in here between all the little cracks and crevices. You know, 2009 set of valve covers has a pretty good accumulation of dirt and grime, as you can imagine. Especially this one, this one being the driver's side one. This top area here uh, is where the refill is for oil on a 5.7, and just from years of kind of dripping oil across this bottom ridge of the valve cover. I literally had to get a small screwdriver out here and just kind of scrape the gunk out of the corners. But you can see that we've got this bottom one taped up. So that's what I was talking about earlier. We've just taped up where the new seal is gonna set just so that we don't get any paint down inside that seal channel. We actually left the old seal in place as well for double, for double protection. So we're gonna do that same uh, tape job on this one. We're just going to, again, tape across where our seal is currently at because, you can again, you can see that we didn't remove the old seal so that way we don't get any paint down inside the seal channel. So we'll get that all taped up and then we'll come through here and we'll make some little rings and get these taped up. So that being said, I'm going to work on this and I'll bring it back in a bit. Bye. And welcome back. So you can see... We've just got a ring of tape around our bottom. And, and, and again, we're, we're taping the bottom of this just to protect from any overspray that might get in underneath the, might get in underneath the edge here as we're painting. Now for these grommets on top, I'm gonna show you what I did on the 6.4 valve cover. Same process, just take a little bit of square of your painter's tape, just kind of place it over there at the top, a little bit of pressure, get it down in. And then what you can do 
and just take a hammer or a hammer type surface and just dent, gently tap around the edge of this painter's tape and that will cause the painter's tape to kind of tear on the edge of this and then what you'll be left with was, is a nice little perfect circle of a covering over that screw hole. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now and then I'll, I'll again, again, you're just going to kind of tap along the edge of this and obviously probably want to use something a little bit heavier but this should give you an example and as you tap across the edge of this you can see it's conforming to the edge of that little riser and eventually that tape will tear through and you can pull the rest of this off but I'm going to do this real quick to this valve cover and I'll, I'll bring you back Okay, so just to show that to you here, and again, I'm just using our little section of cheater pipe that we used before. Just kind of tap it around that edge. And you can see that eventually this painter's tape will start to tear and give way. And then you can just pull the top piece of painter's tape off. And then what you're left with is a nice perfect little covering where you can now paint. And then when you peel these off, these will be nice and protected from uh, any overspray. So I'm going to do the same thing for the rest of the valve cover. And then I'll bring you back and show you it done. Catch you in a bit. And welcome back. So just to show you that we've got that done, you can see that we've got our, all our green dots in place on both valve covers. So we're ready to start spraying these and getting them painted. And it looks like they want you to apply um, all coats and give a 10 minute break between coats but they want you to have all the coats that you want to apply within a one hour window so we're going to work on that we're going to work on getting these coated let them dry adequately between coats and uh, yeah we should be able to get this done one can should be enough it took exactly one can to do the valve covers on the 6.4 and these valve covers really aren't any different uh, than those were uh, just a little bit older but with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start painting on these, and I'll bring you back when they're done. Thank you much. Bye. And welcome back. So just to show you, we've got all our coats on at this point. You can see we're a nice shade of orange. And uh, it was our final coat, as we did utilize uh, the rest of our can. So what we're going to do at this point is just uh, give it some adequate time to dry. I think it says it dries in an hour and can actually be handled in three, but it's one of those typical, you know, they recommend 24 hours. So uh, it'll be, you know, quite a few days yet before these valve covers uh, go back onto the cylinder heads, but at least this point's done. They've got uh, plenty of time to dry between now and the time they need to be used. So just to give you another view there, and uh, what I'll do is... Uh, when I come back, we're going to start looking at uh, the other pieces we're going to put on the engine uh, today. I think what we're going to do is tackle the windage tray. Uh, pick up, we'll put the new windage tray back on. We've already got the pickup tube sitting over there. We went ahead and cleaned it out with a thorough amount of brake clean, got it dried off. And then what we'll do is we'll put the windage tray, the pickup tube, and we'll start putting the timing components uh, back on the front of the engine. So that's going to include installing the new cam, uh, at least getting the timing chain, the guide, the tensioner, and the oil pump, and kind of all that, uh, all those items situated. So when I bring you back, we're going to start cracking on that. Talk to you in a bit. Bye. And welcome back. So before we put the camshaft in and the timing components in, I'm going to do a little bit more cleaning work on this block and just uh, try to clean these pistons up a bit more, get some of the grime off of it and a little bit of the grime off the block. Uh, we'll have more cleaning we need to do and a little bit more surface prep when we're actually ready to put the new head gaskets on and the cylinder heads and so on and so forth. I just want to take a little bit more, take care of a little bit more of this cleaning before we start putting nice new fresh parts uh, on this motor. So with that being said, I'm going to use a little bit of the actual Mopar uh, throttle body cleaner. There's the part number for you. It's going to look a little bit red hue-ish uh, because I'm under the, the canopy right now and the sun's kind of shining through it. There we go. So with that being said, I'm going to use a little bit of this and some blue shop towels you see there and see how good we can get these uh, these pistons to look. And then when we, once we get those cleaned up, then I'll, uh, I'll come back and we'll start prepping to get the cam in and the uh, timing components on the front. And then we'll go from there. But I'll bring it back in a bit. And just to show you, that's the number two piston there before and the number three piston there 
on the driver's side of before and we'll get them cleaned up and we'll bring you back for the after talk to you in a bit bye and welcome back so you can see we've got our pistons clean or at least reasonably clean or definitely cleaner than what they were before so there's the uh number two i'm sorry number four see our number two piston there and a number three piston there far cry better than what they were and to be fair for full disclosure I did have to go back over to just like we did with the 6.4 and use a little bit of brake clean it just did a little bit better job of breaking up that carbon uh, not that the throttle body cleaner that you saw was doing a bad job it just wasn't cutting through it um, as well as the brake clean did now to be fair um, there was only there wasn't too much carbon on these pistons uh, Just a little bit and I think a lot of that was because uh, to, again just due to bad injectors and such I think a lot of this just kind of got washed off naturally But I will say that uh, kind of spraying everything went down with WD-40 like we did uh, about a, a couple weeks ago Definitely helped because even using the brake clean and just like with the 6.4 I know some of you may cringe on this, but it's it's been fine so far I'm using a red Scotch-Brite. This is again the very fine one. You can see the carbon on just this one piece. Uh, and this one actually looks a little bit more worse for wear, that one. And just hit it with a little bit of brake clean and very, very light pressure uh, on that uh, Scotch-Brite. And that carbon was kind of literally just kind of peeling right off of those pistons uh, with no issue. So what I did was as we got each one clean cuz you're going to get you're going to get a little bit of seepage between the the you know between the piston and the wall is that to, as I was rotating it over I would let the two pistons I clean down a little bit and then thoroughly wipe the inside of the cylinders out uh, to make sure that it wasn't getting any any further than just yeah, again, just barely past the, the lip here. So again, same cleaning process we used on the 6.4 and the, the 6.4 has been, you know, fine ever since. So with that being said, I'm gonna clean a little bit more of this mating surface off uh, now that we've got the cleaner out here. Uh, and uh, that way, once we're done, I'll thoroughly coat everything in oil again cylinder walls any exposed metal surfaces just to make sure that it doesn't uh it doesn't start to rust on us and then uh once i get a little bit more of this cleaned up i'll bring you back and then we'll start prepping to put the cam and the other items in other than that i'll talk to you in a bit bye okay so we got the tops of the pistons clean we quickly went over the block the head head gasket surface and the front surface where the timing chain is going to be is going to need more cleaning but we'll do that when we're actually ready to put the seals and the heads and everything back on because what i want to do is get some more wd-40 and soak everything down to wd-40 to help loosen that stuff up like we did with the pistons so i'm not going to go too overboard cleaning it but like we spoke about, we want to get, try to get the oil pan back in. And in order to have the oil pan back in, we got to start putting some of our timing components back in. And this is going to be the first piece. So this is our new cam. Uh, we went ahead and wiped everything off of it as far as the old fingerprints and such. We're going to thoroughly snot it down with some assembly lube, which is right there. It's the same stuff we used when we worked on the, the other truck. Because... Uh, even though we get this all together it's going to be a while before this thing starts and that's the reason for the assembly lube because you definitely don't want this stuff starting dry and it's going to sit here for a bit so that's why we want to thoroughly just snot it all up in this uh red detergent syrup looking stuff when you pour it out of the bottle uh and then we'll start getting some of these timing components in here uh, and then that should allow us to put the windage tray, the oil pickup tube, and the back half of the oil pan back in. So I don't have a tripod out here. It's the same process that, process that you saw me do on the uh, on the 6.4. So I'm not going to put a tripod up and show this to you, but it's the same process as removal. Other than we're just going to put a lot of assembly lube on this and slide this back in. Just like with the removal, you want to be careful that you don't bang these cam lobes into the bearing surfaces and the journal surfaces that these 
sections here right in that the camshaft actually rotates in you don't want to nick them or tear them up because uh, if that happens uh, you know you you could in a sense spin a, a cam bearing you don't want to do that because then that'll keep you from removing the cam ever again so you'll be looking at uh, taking it to a machine shop or put another block in it but i don't know it's a little bit of rambling but i'm going to try to get this cam brought in and uh bring it back you can see the old cam bolt and the old phaser sitting right there. Th these are both going to be replaced. Don't worry. I'm just going to use the old phaser and the old cam bolt to help put this cam in. Uh, a lot of people just use the cam bolt as a handle. I like using the entire phaser because you got a lot more there to grip. So I will usually install the phaser and just put the cam bolt in half hand tight at most and it'll kind of help help you guide it if needed. With that being said, I'm going to work on getting this thing in here and then uh, we'll bring you back. Thank you much. So just want to bring it back and show you the new cams in, but I wanted to show you, uh, as you can see, that phaser is just temporarily bolted on there. Uh, in my experience, the cams go in pretty, pretty easy, but when it gets to that final just little bit, when that main part of the beginning of that cam is, is, is starting to seat into here, it kind of tends to get a little bit tight. Because uh, it is a, they are machine surfaces. It is a machine fit. So unless you've got them exactly lined up, sometimes they can, they can hang a little. And that's what I was saying. It's easier if you can see, you can grab that entire phaser and turn it and manipulate it if if need to be. So now that we've got our cam in, what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, we're going to take that off because we got to put our um, our um, uh, thrust plate, our cam thrust plate, back in and get that torqued down and then we'll work on getting the rest of these timing components in and then we'll bring you back for that bring you back in a bit Bye. welcome back you can see that we've got our temporary uh or older uh cam phaser removed at this point and we've just put our thrust plate in we haven't torqued it yet uh per the manual it looks like they want nine foot pounds on each one of those fasteners uh on the back side of this now remember this plate can only go on one way there's because these bolts have to be countersunk and be flush with the cover otherwise your uh cam phaser when the cam rotates is going to cram in your bolts and it wouldn't be a good thing so that'll only go on one direction but uh prior to putting that on it was probably a bit of an overkill on the back side of this since this is the thrust plate for the cam i smeared it down literally with the same uh assembly lube that we put the cam in with again because it's going to be a little while uh before this engine starts and any and in my opinion anything we can do to keep something that would normally have oil sprayed on it um keep it from any type of a dry start would be a good thing so i'm going to set the torque wrench up to uh nine foot pounds uh then we're going to get these torqued and then i'll mark them with a silver sharpie so that way we know they're done and then we'll move on to the um the next piece talk to you a bit Okay. and welcome back you can see that we've got our um phaser bolts um i'm sorry cam thrust plate bolts torqued and marked at this point again just taking the silver sharpie because it's easy to see the difference between the color of it and the color of the block and you can see we just drew a line through it that lets us know all four of those are torqued and good uh, then we're going to move on to getting the rest of the uh, timing components on here uh, we'll get the gear on here, and then, of course, the guide and the tensioner, uh, and then we'll set the initial timing on here, and I'll bring it back to uh, to show you that. It's the same timing procedure as it was on the 6.4. There's a couple of marks in the chain that the phaser will line up with, and then there's a mark on the chain that a little dot on the um, crank gear will line up with. So I'm going to go get those pieces and then uh, I'll bring you back when we get uh, those pieces installed and get ready to set the initial base timing. And I'll, uh, I'll talk to you in a bit. Bye. And welcome back. So you can see we've got our new phaser um, installed or temporarily installed. That bolt is only hand tight and for a reason. But what we're doing is lining up our timing mark. So hopefully you can see that there. We have we colored it in with a silver Sharpie. And you can see the timing mark on that phaser. You can see that little hole right here. And if we look right above it, you'll see that little indent that's on the inside of that tooth gear. 
and I just you'll, you'll see it colored in with silver sharpie there and you'll see that it's in between the links on the top of the chain with the two rectangles on it and on the bottom one we've also filled that in with the silver sharpie to make it visible but on the lower timing gear you see that one tooth with a little dimple in it that's now been filled in silver and you can see that single timing mark on the lower part of this chain is right on that link so this is base timing for Hemi. Uh, top phaser up at the top between the two marks. Bottom one, a lot of individuals will call that pointing down. That's not really pointing down and it's a bit confusing. I, I got confused when I was doing the timing on the 6.4 because a lot of people kept saying the bottom mark should be pointing down. Albeit argumentatively, that is pointing down, but if you watch Modern Muscles Extreme video and how he sets the timing as well as how we set the timing on the 6-4, that bottom mark is more and more like the 5 o'clock position, not the 6 o'clock position. But the biggest takeaway here is this is setting base timing. So we're on our mark there with our link, with our single rectangle on it, and we're on our timing marks up at the top phaser. So this lower gear is keyed to the crank it can only go on one way same thing with the phaser the phaser has is keyed to a pin that's on the cam so the phaser can only be in one spot and bolted in place so can the lower crank so i guess what i'm saying is as long as you've got your timing marks on the lower gear and the upper phaser in line with the correct spots on the chain then you're good to go so with that being there that would mean if we look over here we should see our number one piston at top dead center. And that pretty much looks like it's at the top to me. So it looks like we're good to go. We're in time at this point. And uh, like I said, with, with this lower crank being keyed, you know you're in the right spot because again, that gear can only go on that crank one way. Oh, let's see. So we got this in place. What we're going to do now is go ahead and put our guide and our tensioner in. And we're not going to torque that uh, cam phaser bolt just yet. When we get the tensioner and the uh, guide in here, we'll hand snug that enough that it'll hold it in place. But once we get our cylinder heads in and get our push rods and everything in place, we want to make sure that the lifters are doing what they're supposed to do and that uh, we see all our valves actuate. And that's the other reason why I didn't want to put this timing cover on before the cylinder heads were on. So we're going to leave that loose so that we can hand rotate the engine, verify everything's actuating, verify we don't have any binding spots, and then if everything's good, then right before we put the timing cover on, the last thing we'll do is we'll torque that bolt down, and I will do to this one just like I did with the 6.4. I will put a little bit of Loctite just for some extra insurance on that cam phaser bolt. Uh, but for now, it'll just be hand tight, and again, I'll show it to you obviously when I get to that process when we're getting ready to, uh, to torque that thing down. But for now, we're going to get the guide and the tensioner in here. We'll get that hardware torqued. And this will put us in a good spot to be able to put our oil pump in. And then we can uh, get to our goal for today, uh, which was to get at least get the windage tray and the oil pan uh, partially reinstalled. And I'll bring you back in a bit. Bye. And welcome back. You can see that we've got our guide uh, again, which is the newer version of guide. You remember the one that came off here was plastic. That one's metal. And we've, so we've got our guide, we've got our tensioner. We're not going to release the tension on the tensioner just yet because we're not ready to do so. Uh, once we've verified, we've got, you know, smooth operation uh, as far as the cylinder heads and such and the push rods. Uh, then we'll proceed forward with uh, torquing that. And then once that's torqued, we'll pull the pin, apply our tension. And then the last thing we'll do is put the timing cover on. But again, to show you that we're still in time on that mark, and we're still in time on our mark up there. And generally, even without the tension on it, normally what you can do on these Hemis is if you have to uh, take that phaser bolt out, you generally can without normally having to hold the phaser in place because with the guide and the tensioner kind of pushing that chain together a little bit, usually it puts enough pressure and takes up enough slack on the chain that 
if you were to take that phaser bolt out, generally it'll kind of hold it in place. Just, you know, some useless trivia for you. So why I'm thinking about this is that I know our original plan was to start getting the oil pan uh, gasket and oil pump and such installed. What I'm thinking I might do next is deviate from that in the next video and go ahead and get the cylinder heads surfaces cleaned up and get them prepped and go ahead and re reinstall our cylinder heads. And the reason why that is is that we can get our potentially get our cylinder heads torqued down get them done leave this lower half exposed in case we need to and it gives us the ability to turn this crank uh without having to potentially take the well, actually no strike that strike that I'm, I'm gonna stick to the original plan um i don't foresee a reason for having to take the oil pump off once we have it on because uh, we all know it's a bit of a bear. Once you have that oil pan in place, it's it's kind of difficult to get to that mounting bolt. Uh, and I don't foresee a reason for having to undo any of this. Uh, and even if we did, we can still get the phaser off of there if we had to without having to take the oil pump off. So yeah, let's do that. Let's stick to the original game plan. And we'll get the oil pump on here next, get the pickup tube put back on, uh, and then uh, proceed to, I'm sorry, it needs to be windage tray, then pickup tube, then oil pan, just because of the way everything fits together. Uh, and also the oil pump. And then we'll, we'll proceed that way. Okay, so let me, get the, let me get some more parts together, get some stuff, uh, straightened out and then I'll bring you back. Talk to you in a bit. Bye. And welcome back. You can see we've got our oil pump in place on our crank gear. You may have to manipulate the oil pump a little bit and by that I mean the splines on the inside of the pump line up with the splines on the lower crank gear. So you may have to manually just turn the, the, the pump stator a little bit to get everything to line up. But when it lines up and finally pushes in place you should be flush up against the oil passages in the block. And there is no seal on this oil pump. It is a metal to metal seal. Uh, so what we're gonna do next is get our bolts in here and get them torqued. And just a word of warning on this one, uh, it's gonna look identically the same, but just a reminder that remember, this is actually a oil pump meant for a Hellcat. And the reason why we're using it here is that we can get a higher volume and greater PSI uh, out of this pump, which will, you know, do us some good. One, with the lower internals being uh, slightly aged on this engine, help protect them, get them some more lubrication, as well as all the new parts we're getting in, help all that uh, get lubricated and stay lubricated better as well. So I'm going to get these. Oh, and I forgot to mention the timing guide and timing tensioner bolts. Uh, per the book I had said eight foot pounds uh, to do those and I'm gonna get the uh, oil pump bolts in here we're gonna get those torqued and uh, when I bring you back I'll let you know what that torque value was so I'll bring you back in a bit Bye. Mm -hmm. welcome back you can see that we've got our uh, oil pump bolts in torqued and marked as such so we know they're done and uh, those oil pump bolts get torqued to 21 foot-pounds. So oil pump retaining bolts, 21 foot-pounds. I did verify this. This is the same torque spec that the 6.4 liter uses on its oil pump. And I also wanted to show you that. You can see that torque sequence there. So it's a standard like cross or X type torque sequence uh, to tighten those up. Starting with that being number one upper left, lower right two, and then lower left three, and then upper right four. It's the same pattern for the uh, cam uh, thrust plate as well. Uh, so with that being said, let's see here. So we've got all that in. 
we know that we know that we got our timing marks in that's the one drawback behind putting the oil pump in you know now versus later is that you lose sight of that timing mark but you know we we know that we're on time because again we checked all of it and even without the tensioner in there even with the guide and just the tensioner even without the pin being pulled it'll take enough slack up to kind of keep everything you know where it needs to be uh, so with that being said um, I'm going to clean up the mating surface on the bottom of the block to get the windage tray and the oil pan up uh, oil windage tray and the pickup tube on and then we can look at getting the uh, oil pan on now it's going to be interesting because remember we've got to put two beads of silicone in those back two corners as we kind of you know sandwich everything together so it's gonna be a little bit of a little bit of a Jenga puzzle but uh, I'll bring you along when we're ready to show that and I'll bring you back in a bit. Bye. And welcome back. So we got our old silicone scraped off of our, our back areas here because as you can see, we're getting ready to put the new windage tray uh, on. And remember, there's a couple areas on here they want you uh, to put some silicone on it. And um, you can see the issue is because you're fighting a big old Jenga puzzle uh, is that you know this windage you gotta put silicone on there put the windage tray up there and then bolt this pickup tube on in its place and you can see this pickup tube kind of limits you how far you can drop this down without your you know windage tray getting into your um, uh, RTV and spearing it because remember we still got to get the pan lined up and get the pan bolted on here So it's a bit of a, a bit of a puzzle And about the best way I could figure this because remember that it's easier to get to that pickup tube bolt that bolts in the bottom of the oil pump without the pan being there uh, And but unfortunately you have to also secure that mounting bolt for the pickup tube before you put the pan back in place so it's Kind of a pain in the rear um, while doing this just because they have that need for that silicone in the back now is that silicone 100 percent critical yeah who knows um i'm sure they had a reason for putting it in there so we're going to try our darnest to get it in there but this is about the best way i can think of is to leave the wooden tray obviously loose the pickup tube is there as you can see but it's just barely threaded on so that way we got enough play in this possible then I'm going to go up front and hook the pickup tube up to the bottom of the oil pump first. And then see how much free play that gives us because it should still leave us with about that much you see there. Which is enough of a gap that we should be able to get our RTV in there and then work on getting our, our pan in place. Because uh, again, the RTV goes between the... Uh, this is your rear main seal cover. This is your block and it's just that where the two metals meet is where they want you to put it And that RTV goes on the other side of this windage tray So I don't care if it touches the other side of this. I just care if it smears it all out of place uh, You know it, it you don't there isn't any RTV between this windage tray and the actual oil pan itself It's just a matter of trying to keep it uh, trying to keep it well enough uh, in place without smearing it so that's about the best way i can think of because again you're you're fighting kind of a jangle puzzle uh, to put this back together now if you weren't worried about the rtv then yeah this is a this is a lot easier done uh let's see here. yeah so anyway i'm gonna fight with this a little bit i did put a new o-ring on the front of that pump seal and i'll i'll show you that here in a bit I'm going to put a little bit of oil on that o-ring just so it doesn't go in dry and then we'll get that bolt secured and then we'll come back underneath here and see how we're going to fidget and fight with this stuff i'll bring it back in a minute right and welcome back so you can see that's our pickup tube that's our oil pump that's our windage tray and you can obviously without the oil pan in here you can see that getting to this bolt which fastens right into here through there is much much easier without the oil pan in here pesky oil pans uh but but we need them you know can't run an engine without them uh let's see so what we want to do is i'm going to put a little oil around that uh, fresh o-ring there get it seated get it tight and then go on from there i'm thinking what i may do to keep 
this kind of where it needs to be is kind of do the same trick we did with the 6.4 and put like a tie wrap around the front of the windage tray right there between the, the two areas here and loop it around uh, the oil pump just to help hold this up, which will give us uh, most of our gap that we need in the back to try to squeeze that silicone in. Because if you put a tie wrap right there, you're not gonna necessarily interfere with the oil pan. Uh, because um, this part of the front windage tray, if you remember, bolts into the actual timing cover. Uh, not the, uh, it goes through the oil pan, but bolts in the timing cover. And obviously we haven't put the timing cover in yet. So we may be able to do this and just kind of hold it in place and help us out a little bit. But I'm gonna work on getting this uh, oil pickup tube in here. It's it's nothing fancy, just again, I don't wanna install a seal dry. We'll get that lubed up, we'll get it in there and get that uh, pickup tube refastened to our oil pump. But I'll bring you back in a bit, bye. Okay, welcome back. So we got our oil pump pickup tube bolted back into our pickup oil pump pickup tube back bolted back into our oil pump say so that three times real fast uh, we went ahead and tightened our center securing bolt just to hold it in place and you can see we got a little bit of room left in there that it can actually drop down before it hits the top of that mounting board for that pickup tube and it looks like it might be just enough of a gap for us to squeeze the tip of our silicone tube into just to put our two beads that we need and then we can try to sneak our oil pan in here and at least get the back bolted up um yeah yeah we'll, we'll put in as many and yeah, we'll put all the oil pan bolts in at this point except for the ones that go in the timing cover because like i said raising up this differential is probably going to be um one of the last things uh that we do uh, just because it's convenient to kind of have it out of the way, at least when dealing with this oil pan. So I'm going to work on getting that silicone up there again on that little transition between the rear main seal. Um, uh, it's a holder, a bracket, but basically the rear main seal is inside this aluminum bracket that then bolts in the back of the engine. But either way, rambling on uh, in that seam. And on the other seam on the other side, and then we're going to finish the oil pan in here and see if we can get this thing to set. Oh, this should be fun. Okay, so I'm going to play around with this, and then I'll, I'll bring you back. Thank you much. Okay, it's probably the worst coverage in the world, but what I found easier to do was that you see these hash areas here. This is kind of where that seam lines up, where that silicone needs to be. So I ended up squirting it in this area on the top of each side on the windage tray. So that way when I sandwich this in place, it should get that silicone where it needs to be. Uh, I probably put way, way too much of a glob in there, but like I said, they didn't give very much room in here to kind of assemble this while it's still inside the, uh, the vehicle, I guess. But uh, I'm going to go with this. We're going to try to see if we can fish the oil pan up in here and then go from there. Bring it back in a bit. And welcome back. So as you can see, we got our oil pan reinstalled. Um, it's a bit messy, but you can see the RTV kind of scooshing out of the sides, uh, which is what we were looking for. And uh, I went ahead and just put all the oil pan bolts in, except for the five needed for the timing cover. We may have to loosen up some of the front ones to get the gap we need. Yeah, to put the to put the silicone on the front, but we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But uh, they're hand tight for now. And there is a torque spec on these. I believe it's nine foot pounds. Uh, and there is a there is a pattern to it. It's 21 bolts. They have you go in a certain sequence. But uh, I'm gonna say, just as Reignited said, uh, no need to get full animal on these. Just, you know, get them down, hand snug them. Uh, and that should be good enough. I went around the pan twice and made sure they were nice and snug. We made sure that we got our two short studs on this side so we can clip our wiring harness back in and we had our one long stud which was in the third bolt hole down that our transmission line can go into that bracket in that 
and then push back up onto that stud and it'll hold out in place. So that'll be one of the final assembly items. We need to make sure that we just put that, uh, that piece back on. And we'll do that once we know that we're done monkeying with the uh, oil pan bolts. But for now, we got all of them in except for the five remaining that all bolt into the uh, timing cover itself. Uh, and with that being said, I'm going to call this a video at this point because it's uh, been a pretty long video as well as a long day. But to recap, we've got our cam in, we got our timing components in, we have the engine timed, we got our oil pickup tube cleaned out and reinstalled, we got it uh, hooked back up to the oil pump, we got our new windage tray installed, and obviously you can see that we got our new oil pan installed. So we made a pretty good amount of progress. The next item that we'll have to tackle is uh, getting the lifters installed into the cylinder head and that's pretty straightforward and then start prepping to put the cylinder heads themselves uh, back on uh, let's see here what I may see if we can do because it does make it easier to get the cylinder heads on is see if I can drop that lower um, exhaust hanger which should get the exhaust to drop down a couple inches uh, and then once that happens, uh, like I said, it'll be easier to get the cylinder heads in if you don't, if you're not hitting up against those collectors, uh, trying to make it in because the position it's in right now is the position it's in when it's bolted to the head. And sometimes, like I said, you just get, getting stuff out of our way to make the install easier. Uh, and obviously, you know, once, once we know that we're said and done, we're getting ready to wrap things up before we start it, we'll, we'll come back here and, and put our inspection plate. Uh, back in for our our transmission oh but let's see i think that will do it for now um here's a question for you feel free to put your comments in the comment box below but uh i bought oxygen sensors for this truck thinking that uh you know just preemptively purchased them due to the age of the vehicle and thinking that may have been the the original cause or one of the causes to find the multi-cylinder multi misfire now with the cylinder heads removed you can see you've got nice and good easy access on both sides to get those oxygen sensors out so the question is do you play with it do you monkey with it do you take those oxygen sensors out and just go ahead and replace them since you're here or do you leave well enough alone, get everything reassembled and, you know, see if they work first? Or like I said, do you just preemptively, just due to the age of the vehicle, just go ahead and change them out? Not quite sure if I want to change those out yet. The oxygen sensors, you can see, like I said, are easy to get to. The connectors are easy to get to on all of them, but that one, which is this would be passenger side. So this would be bank two, sensor two, because it's in the cat. And you can see that oxygen sensor wire runs all the way up and plugs into the very top of the transmission dead center. There is no easy way to get to that. You have to do that by feel. It's just like it was on the 2500 that we did where you kind of had to reach up into a valley that was at the top of the transmission do it all by feel. And it was a bear. It was a pain in the rear to get that one disconnected and reconnected so i don't know that that may be mo that may be enough motivation right there just to not do it as far as dropping the exhaust a few inches it looks like we've got the slack to do it once we get that hanger done and i may do that again just to get these collectors out of the way to get these heads on easier but uh again you can see it right here there's our third party oil pan there's the specter there's the part number it, it it fit like a glove all the bolt holes lined up so zero issue with it the only thing i saw which I don't, I don't think it's really an issue is that the size of the drain plug and diameter is is a scooch bit smaller than oem and it just means that uh what's going to happen is that when you go to drain oil in this it's just going to take a little bit longer to drain out but other than that not too terrible uh i do want to show you one thing on front before we wrap it up just to show you that it did work we put that tie wrap up front to hold the front part of this you had to forgive me i gotta crawl myself around here without cracking my head open at the same time 
uh, you can see that tie wrap right there that we loop through the front of that uh, oil pan gasket windage tray and just put it around the crank. That's when we were installing the oil pan just to help us kind of keep that out of the way. Now, what you can see right there is um, that's where that RTV needs, needs to go. So it looks like we may not even have to drop this windage tray to get that in there. We can just put a dollop of silicone on that seam, on that seam, slam our timing cover on it and consider it a good day because uh, that timing cover and that block is right where that seam is gonna be and that's right where that edge that we have exposed is. So then again, this is just a tip for you. If you've got to do this job and you can't get this thing lifted up or pulled out and you got to do this from underneath, that, that tie wrap did help to hold this in place until we got that oil pan started. Well, with that being said, I'll cut it at this point. Um, I will save this for the end of the video. If you haven't subscribed, uh, please consider to do so. We're almost at the thousand subscriber count at that point. And uh, like I said, if you haven't considered to do so and you found it useful, uh, please consider doing so even if you found it useful to the point that you're looking at what I'm doing and saying man I would never do it this way subscribe for more because I'm sure I got more you know idiotic stuff coming down the pipe uh, with that being said I'll let you go and I'll talk to you later bye okay everybody just want to recap this real quick I was just cleaning out the old oil pan and uh, you can see a lot more glitter in the bottom of this pan kind of looks like you're panning for gold uh, you can see right there what came out on the uh, on the shop towel. You see all that glitter, which is actually a good thing because that means at least it made it into the pan, and at least this section of it didn't make it any further. But uh, I don't know. Thought you might like to see that as kind of a recap. Obviously, you know this this pan's bent. I mean, yeah, you could bend it back in shape and perchance keep it, but I'm not going to keep it. But I did want to clean it out before I uh, disposed of it, and that's when we discovered. You know, there's aluminum, I'm sorry, hardened steel in there, there are heels. Uh, with that being said, I'll let you go. Thank you much. Bye.